to our discussion tonight of the question, is theistic belief rational in a scientific age? Now, my name is Larry Cahoon, I'm a professor of philosophy at Holy Cross. I'll be the moderator for the evening. And let me just tell you a few things about uh, uh, who's responsible for this event and uh, what's going to happen. So I'd like to thank the uh, McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, which is the main sponsor of this event. But also, this is one of the Deacon family lectures on religion and modernity. Uh, I thank Tom Landy, who is the director of the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and Professors Matt Koss and uh, Chuck Anderton, who's down here, you'll see them later, uh, for helping the organizing of the event. So what we're going to do is, um, after I talk for just a few minutes, each of our speakers will have 15 minutes, I'll introduce them in a moment. Each of the speakers will have 15 minutes to, uh, to give their general position, one after the other. Uh, at that point, we'll then have 20 minutes of uh, discussion between them where I may ask some questions, they can question each other, and that will take us up to about an hour. Then at that point, for 35 minutes, we'll have questions both from the audience and uh, from others watching on YouTube, which I'll describe in a moment. Then after that, each speaker will have five minutes to sum up, and we'll end about 8.45. So this event is being streamed on YouTube and can be watched later by anybody here. Um, after each speaker's, while the speakers uh, present and discuss, it's possible for audience members to write down questions on the handy cards you may have received, hopefully, and they'll be collected by two of our professors um, and then given to me as uh, the moderator. Also, there'll be mic their microphones set up so you can ask questions through the card or at the microphone. And also, uh, uh, people watching at home on YouTube can participate by sending their comments through on live chat. Now let me introduce our speakers. Dr. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. At the age of 16, as a junior high and high school, he first heard the message of the Christian gospel and yielded his life to Christ. Dr. Cray pursued his studies at Wheaton College and graduate work at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the University of Birmingham, and the University of Munich. He taught religion at Trinity during which time, um, and then in uh, uh, 1987, moved to Brussels, Belgium, where Dr. Cray pursued research at the U University of Louvain. He is the author and editor of over uh, 30 books, including, most prominently, there's a few of them, The Kalan Cosmological Argument, Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus, Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom, and Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology. In 2016, Dr. Craig was named by the best schools as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers. Also speaking will be Dr. Jeff Hester. He is Professor Emeritus in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. An astrophysicist, <coughs> Jeff is well known for his work with the Hubble Space Telescope. He was part of the teams responsible for three of the Hubble instruments, including the camera that saved the Hubble mission after the discovery of the telescope's flawed mirror. He's an accomplished uh, author of over 300 papers and, con and conference contributions, and a lead author of a popular introductory textbook. Also an accomplished public communicator of science, whose broadcaster Hugh Downs referred to as one of the great explainers in our midst. Uh, uh, one of his Hubble images, the Pillars of Creation, was selected by Ten Magazine as among 100 most influential photographs in history. He offers his thoughts on science, society, and philosophy 
in a monthly astronomy magazine column for your consideration. Uh, before Dr. Craig comes up to speak, could I please ask you to welcome both of our speakers. Conviction, 
I'm going to offer two lines of evidence tonight. First, um, this first reason is so simple, uh, so elementary that you don't need to be a philosopher to understand it. It's that there are simply indisputable examples of reasonable, scientifically informed people who believe in God. Let me name just a few whom I've gotten to know from Editor Hester's own area of specialization, astronomy and astrophysics. First, Alan Sandage, called the grand old man of American astronomy. Sandage, who was a protege of Edwin Hubble, uh, who discovered the galactic redshift, has been called the greatest astronomer of the 20th century. At the height of his career, Alan Sandage became a Christian and was thereafter outspoken about his Christian beliefs. Gustav Thomann, a Swiss-German astronomer and astrophysicist, together with Sandage, who pioneered over several decades a quest for two crucial numbers of observational astronomy, the value of the Hubble constant and the value of the deceleration parameter of the expanding universe. Tannen believed that as physics probes the universe, it encounters what he called signposts of transcendence, pointing beyond the universe to its ground in a supernatural creator. George Ellis, a mathematical astrophysicist at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Tony Rothman, another astrophysicist, once described Ellis to me as the person who probably knows more about cosmology than any other man alive. Ellis is a Quaker and often participates in conferences on the integration of science and theology. When I presented a paper on God's existence at a conference on galaxy formation several years ago in Johannesburg, Ellis was assigned as my commentator. Naturally, I wondered what he was going to say. Well, not only did he confirm my argument for God based on the beginning of the universe, but he went even beyond it by defending the existence of God on moral grounds as well. Don Page is a prominent quantum cosmologist at the University of Alberta in Canada. A student of Stephen Hawking, Page is well known for his papers written in collaboration with his mentor. Unlike Hawking, however, Page is a deeply committed Christian. In fact, not merely a Christian, but a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist as well. Finally, Christopher Isham of Imperial College in London. Isham has been called Great Britain's greatest quantum cosmologist. Quite a reputation when you reflect that that includes Stephen Hawking. Isham is an outspoken theist who publishes on and speaks on the integration of theology and science. These scientists are among the greatest astronomers and astrophysicists of our age. It would be absurd to say that they are not scientifically informed. It would be equally false to say that they are not rational. Indeed, I think that would be arrogant and condescending. The argument that I'm offering here is called uh, refutation by means of counterexample. It's a simple but devastating argument. If someone says that there are no black swans, show him one. <laughs> if someone says that there are no egg-laying mammals, show him one. If someone says that there are no reasonable, scientifically informed theists, show him some. I consider these counterexamples to be decisive in refuting the claim that rational belief in God is not possible for a scientifically informed person. My second line of evidence is that there are arguments for the existence of God which make it reasonable 
to believe that God exists. In the course of my career as a professional philosopher, I've defended various arguments for God's existence. We've posted videos about several of these on our website, reasonablefaith.org. In the brief time that I have now, let me just put a few of these out on the table so that later we can discuss any of them that we care to. First, the Kalam cosmological argument. There are three simple premises of this argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. By the universe, I mean all of continuous physical reality. So that would comprise any hypothesized multiverse as well. In support of the crucial second premise, I've offered both philosophical arguments for the finitude of the past and scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe. The philosophical arguments are based on the metaphysical impossibility of the existence of an actual infinity of things and the impossibility of the formation of an actual infinite by successive addition. Premise two is also supported by scientific evidence concerning the expansion of the universe and the thermodynamic properties of the universe. Since something cannot come into being from nothing, the beginning of the universe implies the existence of a beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, changeless, immaterial, enormously powerful creator of the universe. Second, the teleological argument from the fine-tuning of the universe. This argument also has three simple premises. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. It is not due to physical necessity or chance, therefore it is due to design. It's important that we understand that the term fine-tuning does not mean design. The expression is a neutral term, which just means that the range of life-permitting values for the fundamental constants and quantities of nature is incomprehensibly narrow. Fine-tuning in this neutral sense has been well established. Now, there are three live explanatory options in the contemporary literature on fine-tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Virtually no scientifically informed person thinks that the fine-tuning is due to physical necessity. The only plausible alternative to design is the multiverse chance explanation. Um, but the multiverse, as an explanation of fine-tuning, faces very powerful objections which render it implausible. With the failure of the multiverse hypothesis, the alternative of chance <coughs> collapses, and thus, I think, leaves design as the best explanation. Third, the moral argument. Again, this argument can be very simply formulated. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist, Therefore, God exists. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding independently of whether anybody believes in them or not. Many prominent atheist philosophers, such as Friedrich Nietzsche, Bertrand Russell, and Jean Paul Sartre, argue that if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. For in the absence of God, there is no absolute standard of value and no source of objective moral obligation or prohibition. Morality is just a human delusion fogged off on us by biological evolution and social conditioning. But it's plausible that objective moral values and duties do exist. Philosopher of science Michael Roos has said, and I quote, the man who thinks that it is morally acceptable to rape little children 
is just as mistaken as a man who thinks two plus two equals five. Now that is surely a reasonable view. As Louise Antony put it in our debate on the existence of God, any argument for moral skepticism is going to be based on premises which are less obvious than the existence of the moral values themselves. Finally, the ontological argument. This argument is a bit more complex. Define a maximally great being as a being which is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every possible world. Then we may argue as follows. It's possible that a maximally great being exists. If it's possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. If a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. If a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. If a maximally great being exists in the actual world, then a maximally great being exists. Therefore, a maximally great being exists. Now, I realize that those of you who are not philosophy students are apt to think that this argument is a logical trick. But then you'd be surprised to learn that steps two to six of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. The whole argument depends on premise one. Is it possible that a maximally great being exists? Well, reasonable people disagree. The concept of a being, which is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every possible world, seems perfectly coherent. Therefore, it's reasonable to think that the premise one is true. Therefore, the ontological argument shows that it's at least reasonable to think that God exists. So, in summary, we've seen two reasons in support of an affirmative answer to tonight's question. First, there are indisputable examples of reasonable, scientifically informed people who believe in God. And secondly, there are arguments for the existence of God which make it reasonable to believe that God exists. Therefore, I think that theistic belief is rational in a scientific age.
much to my surprise and frankly consternation, in six months I was an atheist. Bill is a Christian apologist. He starts by saying that he has certain answers, and then he works to justify those answers. I'm a scientist. I kind of know differently. I start by saying I don't claim any certain answers, but I've got ideas. And then what I do is I challenge those ideas. I test them. I try to show that they're wrong. If an idea can withstand that kind of scrutiny, then I'm obliged to keep it. If an idea can't withstand that kind of scrutiny, then I am obliged to discard it. So in my world, I know means that I work as hard as I can to show that an idea is incorrect, but so far have failed. And so as a scientist, what I define as rational is application of that standard, which is what I'm going to do tonight. OK. When you listen to what Bill talks about, um, and it's not his presentation, but I'm, I'm going to, he has spoken about this a lot. He talks a lot about God being the best explanation for things. And here's how that works. I don't understand why the sun moves through the sky. Therefore, God's the best explanation. I don't understand why the wind blows. Well, God's the best explanation. There are things about the Big Bang that we don't understand. Therefore, Bill says God's the best explanation. I had a profound emotional experience. God's the best explanation. Now, if you think about it for a second, the problem with this is obvious. Whatever happens, God did it. Which means that doesn't really tell us anything about the world. On the other hand, applying that standard of testable knowledge turns out over time a lot of the places that God hid have gone away. This is what the people who wrote the Bible imagined the world was like. Okay? Presumably they had some kind of a hotline to God. And yet, they got it wrong. From the ground up, they got it wrong. About the only place these days that you can even, here's the button I'm looking for, about the only place these days that you can even almost talk about meeting something supernatural, meeting a God, is when you talk about mind.
Now, evolutionary biologists talk about the four F's of evolution. Anybody here know what the four F's of evolution are? There's feeding, there's fighting, there's fleeing, you know where this is going, and fleeing, and there's, uh, shall I call it reproduction? Yeah, okay, all right. Biologists are like that. Um, if your ancestors had done those four things well, you would be. Humans have two great evolutionary adaptations. One of those is our brains, the other is our tribes. We are profoundly tribal. Humans will do anything, say anything, believe anything that their tribe wants them to. And the reason for that's obvious. On the savannah, without your tribe, your name was lunch. And you weren't passing your genes on to anybody. Now, ironically, one of the best places to see the impact of tribalism today is actually looking at religious belief. If I know the happenstance of your birth, if I know who your tribe is, with very, very few exceptions, I know what your religion is. People may imagine I am my religion because of the power of scripture or because of a, a conversion experience. I felt God. The day to say otherwise. The fact is, is that theists are theists. They got their beliefs from their tribe. They got their beliefs from their tribe. They got their beliefs from their tribe. But we do need to ask where it is that those beliefs came from in the first place. Okay. To do that, we need to talk about perception. A theme for me is that our intuitions about the way things in the world work are almost always wrong. It is irrational to imagine, for example, that your perceptions give you direct information about the way the world is. Because they don't. Most people imagine that perception is this passive process whereby the world just comes to us through our senses. The reality, though, is way cooler. Um, a hundred years ago, physicists revolutionized our understanding of the world. Right now, we are in the midst of a revolution of our understanding of our minds and ourselves. Anil Seth from the Sackler Center of Consciousness Science is going to tell you a bit about your predicted brain. You might have heard that we know nothing about how the brain and body give rise to consciousness. Some people even say it's beyond the reach of science altogether. But in fact, the last 25 years have seen an explosion of scientific work in this area. If you come to my lab at the University of Sussex, you will find scientists from all different disciplines, and sometimes even philosophers. All of us together trying to understand how consciousness happens instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain from the outside world. It depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. Perception, right here and right now, is also a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are being reined in by sensory information in the world. In fact, we're all hallucinating all the time, including right now. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, we call that reality, and there are experiences of being a continuous and distinctive person over time, built from a rich set of memories and social interactions. Now, many experiments show, and psychiatrists and neurologists know very well, that these different ways in which we experience being a self can all come apart. And what this means is a basic background experience of being a unified self is a rather fragile construction of the brain. So our experiences of the world around us and ourselves within it, well, they're kinds of controlled hallucinations that have been shaped over millions of years of evolution to keep us alive in a world full of danger and opportunity. Any education majors people want to feel like that in the, in the room? Okay. <laughs> Anybody who does that kind of stuff, what you're looking at here is you're looking at the neurological underpinnings of constructivism. Now, it's often said that C 
seeing is believing. The reality is exactly the opposite. Believing is seeing. Bible says, seek and ye shall find. It's absolutely right. Seek and ye shall find whatever your tribe expects you to. Because on the savanna to fail to do so meant that you were watching. Now, this goes to the very heart of what we're here to talk about this evening. This is Bill Gregg. In the absence of some overriding defeater of my experience, I am rational to believe that my, what my experience tells me. God is real to me. He is real in my experience. I am perfectly rational in believing that unless and until I am given a defeater for that belief. What I just provided is exactly what Bill asked for. I just provided a, a defeater for that belief. The view in that first paragraph that my experiences give me direct information about the world is known to be untrue. A belief that rests on that is irrational. And frankly, again, Bill said that. I think I met the standard, which means we should all just go home and drink beer or something. But where did gods come from in the first place? This is fun. Our brains construct our consciousness. They have tools to construct our consciousness. And among those tools are things called cognitive biases. Now, cognitive biases sound like bad things, but they're actually incredibly adaptive. For example, we perceive non-existent agency, which means that we perceive action with intention even when there's no intention here. This is a good one to talk about because it shows the difference between perceiving adaptively, which is what evolution gave us brains to do, and perceiving truth, which is kind of what theism rests on. Your dog perceives non-existent agency. You hear a wind blow against the, the side of the house at night and your dog completely loses it. The reason your dog completely loses it is your dog thinks that that's what's outside and it's coming to get Okay? <laughs> Think about that for a second. If it is really just a wind blowing up against the side of the house, it doesn't matter. Your dog got upset. It will go back to sleep. No problem. On the other hand, if there really is something out to get him, getting upset about it ahead of time is probably going to save his life. It is adaptive to see agency where none exists. It is adaptive to see purpose where none exists. We see non-existent pattern of meaning. We imagine non-existent entities and events. And then we have theory of mind. Theory of mind. When we extend the theory of mind, we imagine other people have minds, but we also extend theory of mind to anything that we perceive as having agency. And there's nothing controversial about that. Get a, psychiatrist, get a psychologist up here, and they will give you many, many experiments that show that. And so what do our evolved adaptive brains do? Well, they invent imaginary entities to explain the world and imbue them with agency, purpose, pattern, meaning, and mind. If that is not a description of inventing gods, I don't know what would be. And in fact, we see that going on. Um, kids. A significant fraction of kids invent imaginary friends, and many of them imbue those imaginary friends with superpowers. Children invent gods all the time. The difference being is that this process can be social. How long? One minute. minute. Yep. Oh, this process is social. Once a tribe invents a god, it's hard to get rid of. So of course every society ever has invented gods. There's what it means to be rational. <clears throat> Applying that theism is clearly an artifact of our evolutionary history. <coughs> Believing in theism requires that you accept a kind of evidence that is known to be rational. This is uncomfortable. And I'm not going to change your minds. 
because it is very adaptive for you to accept the beliefs of your tribe. And your adaptive brain is not going to let you listen to this and reject your beliefs. So what am I doing here? Well, there are people in the room tonight who, like I was 45 years ago, are struggling with this kind of stuff. And that's hard. It would have made a big difference to me when I was a kid to have heard that. The view from this side of the fence is extraordinary. We are not created beings here at the whim of some, some petty narcissistic god that so wants to be worshipped that will damn us all the hell for eternity if we don't. What we are are evolved, emergent minds that have reached the point that we can look at the universe, we can look at the world, we can look at ourselves. Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. My life is, feels meaningful, therefore it is. My words to those of you out there who are kind of thinking about this stuff, come on in, the water's fine. Thank you very much.
for them were perfectly reasonable belief forming systems. Let me, let, me, let me turn that around and ask you, accepting for the moment that we live in a world where if you start with things like the laws, of, for those of you who were at the, the lunch talk today, we went through this, you can start our universe and say, let the laws of physics do their thing, and we wind up here. Given that fact, up to and including we're sitting here and we've got conscious minds and we invent gods and so on and so forth, upon what do you then base the claim that you also need a deity? Well, I gave you back in four or five reasons. And I showed four or five reasons that, that are not, okay. You didn't respond to any of those arguments, yeah. We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. That leads to another point. You continually ascribe to theists this problem of tribalism, projection, and so forth. How is it that you have managed to free yourself of these same influences? Is that is a double answer? No, that is a, that is a neat question. And you're right. Scientists are people just like everybody else. Which is why, for example, if you're really going to do philosophy of science, you have to read not only Popper, but you also have to read people like here. But anyway. In science, the shared common thing that you're dedicated to is that you care about what's real, and the way that you get there is by applying that epistemological standard. And so in our tribe, it doesn't matter what you believe, it matters how you got there and how you test it. Okay? And another question is why is it that some people are comfortable doing that and others aren't? You know, I said that. Most of the people in this room are not going to be happy challenging this because the cost is going to be too high to them. So why am I happy challenging it? Well, let's do a little population genetics for a minute. Suppose there is a population of people, and in this population of people, nobody went along with the tribe. That tribe's toast. That's not going to work. But now let's imagine that this population of people Everybody goes along with the tribe, and that tribe encounters a novel challenge. That tribe is dead. To have a healthy population, you have to have some fraction of people who do not feel the same compulsion to accept the judgment of the tribe or the beliefs of the tribe. And I kind of think that today all of those people wind up as scientists. Can I ask a question? So are you suggesting, I don't know if this is Jonathan Haidt spoke earlier here. Seriously. Oh, okay. Last week. All right. so, uh, I wondered if I, and part of his claim is uh, in moral psychology is that, right, that we have, human beings have the omnivorous dilemma, which is, we, we can eat all sorts of stuff. Now this means, on the one hand, whereas other species tend to be more conservative, we're capable of moving, moving into a new environment, finding new stuff to eat. Right. However, there's a, there, there must be a balance between these two things. One, right. trying to seek stability, and on the other hand, ignoring the possible advantages of novelty. Yeah. But my question to you is then, if that's what you say, so you're saying, Society needs to have, you think human societies need to have people who believe in old things and people who don't and are seeking new things, and they're both somehow equally required, so are they both equally right? Okay, I, I understand the question. First of all, what I said is that given that we are formed by evolutionary pressures, the evolutionary pressures on the populations from which we came required that the majority of people go along because if everybody's squabbling and the tiger comes along, then well, so much for that tribe. But also required people who were out of the wings. Okay. As for the other, I believe the question tonight is whether it is rational to hold these beliefs. I said it's adaptive. I understand it's adaptive to all these beliefs. But if we're talking about the rationality of the belief itself, that's a different question. And so yeah, it is adaptive. Nobody, I doubt that anybody in this room is going to go away at the end of the night and say, ah, I've seen the light, 
and not to discard stuff because it is too adaptive to hold on to it. But that doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's rational. It doesn't mean it's false either, Jeff. Doesn't mean that doesn't mean that angels carry planets around with us. One has good reasons for what one believes. One is operating with the same sort of methodology that the objective scientists. But there's nothing about science okay. that implies atheism. But what are your reasons? Well, I have some. Okay. Now, let's talk. Let's talk. Okay. Let's talk. Let's talk. Okay. Okay. Let's talk. Okay. 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 That there are indisputable examples of scientifically informed, rational people who believe in God. Yeah. And you have to take this extraordinary position that people like George Ellis and Christopher Heisham are irrational no. in, their, in their beliefs. The position, the position that I took is that very brilliant people can have irrational beliefs, like these Albert Einstein and Example. The fact that Albert Einstein didn't believe in quantum mechanics didn't mean that that was a rational belief. The fact that a group of, of astronomers, all of whom were born over 70 years ago, none of whom are really at the cutting age, of, and that matters, none of whom are at the cutting age of anything right now. You don't think there are any young scientifically informed? I think, I, think, I think that if you actually look at the statistics, for example, if you look at members of the National Academy of Sciences, I believe that you will find that something of order 93% of them say no God. Okay? There are counterexamples, certainly. But if you look at what applying this kind of reasoning to the world where it leads you, it does not lead you to God. Well, now, you describe it as a nice tribal. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, my own, my own And it's funny, because when you talk to scientists, most scientists share very similar experiences. I set out expecting to find God, hoping to find God, looking for God, and that is not where honest investigation led me. If you look at most people who are in the sciences, they do not land there and say, okay, I'm going to be an atheist now. The much more common experience was what I talked about, that that one of the nice things when I was at the stage of struggling with this and hearing a talk like mine is it would have let me know that there were tribes out there where I could belong without claiming to believe things I didn't believe. And so in saying, oh, scientists being atheists is just a tribal thing, you're putting the cart before the horse. According to the statistics I've seen, the same percentage of scientists who believe in God today is about the same as it was in 1909. That it really hasn't change significantly. And so I don't think this idea that younger scientists are becoming more secularized holds up. But let me, let me say something about the Einstein example, because I really want to challenge that. Jeff, you are prepared to say that Albert Einstein was irrational because he challenged quantum mechanics. Now, that, that strikes me as extraordinary. It seems no, to me that well, was I, perfectly rational on Einstein's part. And in fact, what he was challenging, Jeff, wasn't quantum mechanics. It was quantum indeterminacy. And there are good many interpretations of quantum mechanics today that are fully deterministic. Not anymore. That, oh, that's we not can, true. If you, if you want to talk about the implications of, uh, of quantum entanglement, if you want to talk about the reasons why the Bohemians can't get it right, we can have that conversation. I don't think this is the right audience to have that conversation in front of. The fact is that where things are going right now in quantum mechanics, the, the reason that a quantum computer will work is because quantum indeterminacy is real. The reason why, they have now done tests looking at quantum indeterminacy, where to be certain there's no connection, they have looked at quasars using those to trigger two measurements to make sure there's no funny talking back and forth, the, the predictions of quantum mechanics, including quantum indeterminacy, just work. And all the ways that people have tried to get out of that pretty well fail. Can, 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 can I interrupt? Well, I want to just say one thing. Go ahead. It doesn't show that Albert Einstein in the 30s was irrational. Well, 
Can, can I, can I, I just, just to put a point on this? So in other words, it would be one thing to say that Einstein was wrong in his opposition to quantum mechanics. It would be another thing to say that he was irrational. Saying he was irrational kind of sounds like you're saying whoever's wrong is irrational. No. In other words, in other words, assuming rationality has something to do with following a method, and then sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But so maybe Einstein got it wrong then, but Okay, what, let, me, let me clarify. What happened with Einstein is certainly when Einstein was young during the 1920s, when he and Bohr were going back and forth with their Dubon experiments, all of that, it was, it was a perfectly rational position to hold. But as the years went by and the evidence piled up and the evidence piled up and the evidence piled up, the view that quantum mechanics had to be wrong was so much a part of Einstein's internally constructed world that he ceased to be able to look at the evidence objectively. He ceased to be able to apply the standard that if something can withstand that kind of scrutiny, you were obliged to accept it. At which point, using the definition of rationality that I'm using, which I think is appropriate if we're talking about whether theism is rational in an age of science. What is that <laughs> That belief was irrational. What is that definition? The definition is, if you're talking about rationality in an age of science, it is fundamentally an epistemological statement that I understand that I don't get certainty, but what I do is, if I've got an idea, I challenge that idea in every way that I can imagine to challenge it. If that idea cannot withstand that scrutiny, which I argue it is, it can't. If an idea cannot withstand that scrutiny, it is irrational for me to, to continue to believe it. It's something, hey, I believe this. On the other hand, if an idea can withstand that kind of scrutiny, it is irrational to reject it out of hand. So as a scientist in an age of science who, who lives that culture, that's how I understand rationality. Using that definition, Einstein reached the point where his rejection of, <coughs> of quantum mechanics was no longer rational. His rejection of quantum mechanics. <coughs> his rejection of quantum mechanics. I, I don't think they ever reached that point. There are plenty of philosophers of science today who don't accept quantum interdependency that adopt a different, empirically equivalent interpretation of the equations of quantum mechanics. Again, this is not okay. We are we are at a point where no one in this audience has the background right. to follow where that conversation goes, right. and so I don't I don't want to follow okay. around here. Yeah. Okay. Then, then let's go to your definition of rationality. Okay. I, I think that this is an idiosyncratic and flawed conception of what it is to be rational. I, I, I find that amusing as we sit here on this stage, in this building, with cameras sending this conversation out to the world, all of which is based upon <laughs> that definition of rationality. I, I don't know of anyone who thinks that that is the definition of rationality other than yourself. <laughs> Surviving attempts at falsification is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for knowledge. But even given, well, let's call this Hester rationality, uh, <laughs> this is a Socratic view of rationality, Hester rationality. Even given that definition of rationality, it seems to me that belief in God is Hester rational because belief in God has survived every attempt to falsify it. You can't falsify it by using the genetic fallacy. There have been two principal ways in which people have tried to falsify theism. One would be by showing an incoherence in the concept of God. A logically incoherent concept cannot be instantiated. You're familiar with paradoxes of omnipotence, perhaps, or omniscience. Second would be to show that the existence of God is incompatible with some sort of fact of the world that we're aware of, such as evil and suffering. And in both of these cases, neither attempt to falsify God's existence has been successful. It has survived 
attempts at falsification and is therefore, by your own definition, rational. Over history, God has been the explanation of, okay, there's this canopy above. Well, no, got that one wrong. God has been the explanation of, well, how, how do we become born? Well, got that one wrong. God has been the explanation of what makes life life. Well, sorry, got that one wrong. God is the explanation of why do we have conscious experience? Well, sorry, it's turning out we got that one wrong. The way this works is, you take the idea, if, if you put atheism on one side, and you put the, can those both be true? Can atheism no. and theism both be true? Okay. So I have to find a way to discriminate between those two. True? Yes. Okay. The way I discriminate between those two is I look at them and I say, all right, are the implications of atheism, do they keep, does atheism keep getting it right? God does. I'm not aware of any consequences of atheism that are incorrect. We will get to On the other hand, when I put it, when I get his hot face just lighted a little bit up, we'll talk here in a minute about how it is that theistic values are the most amazingly sociobiological things I've ever seen in my life. But anyway, I did genetic fallacy again. Oh, I, can I respond to the genetic fallacy? How about let's do that and okay. then go to the question. Very good. Calling something a genetic fallacy, calling it a name, it is possible that completely crazy reasoning gets you to something that's true. That is possible. It's not likely. If you have good reasoning, good evidence across the board that gets you one idea, that is in contradiction to another idea, then saying that, well, but this other idea still might be right because after all, genetic fallacy. That's, that's, is that really, is that the hill you want to die on? That's not the method that I adopted tonight, nor is it, Jeff, your criterion of rationality. What you said was not that something is rational if it is supported by the bulk of the evidence or if it's verified by the evidence. No, what I you never, said was, I never, I never used the term verified. I, know, I said you, right, that right, is right, not right, what you right, said. Right. You said if it survives attempts at falsification. And my point is that theism has survived attempts at falsification <laughs> principally. Okay, let's, let's okay. thank you. Okay. okay. Let's All right. Let's have a lot of questions. Okay. All right, so uh, I suggest what I'll do is we'll start especially with questions that are targeted at you. Okay, all right. Now, alternate questions, but try to keep the answer to the relative degree. We have a bunch of questions. Uh, so first, for Jeff, okay. uh, this is from the YouTube channel. Our senses are byproducts of evolution. Does that mean that the things that our senses perceive no, that absolutely does not believe in that. That's a fascinating question, though. For me personally, that goes to how you break out of solipsism, actually. You know, I, we, we are trapped inside of our heads, and so, yeah, we could be raised in a jar or whatever. Thing is, though, I, I have a theory, and my theory is that we, in fact, do live in an objective world, and all of you people are real people, so I'm not talking to a bunch of pigments in my imagination. That theory says all sorts of things about how the behaviors I should see and so on and so forth. Turns out my theory that there's an objective world out there that you people are real and so on and so forth makes all sorts of testable predictions that turn out to be correct. And so applying my standard of knowledge, I feel perfectly happy saying, yeah, there's there's a world out there. The difference, though, is that we share an objective room Physical reality is there, except, and this is kind of cool, each and every person in this room has their own experiential reality. The world that you experience, constructed by your brain, from your experiences, beliefs, so on and so forth, is yours and yours alone. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, here's a, a different question for uh, 
Could you speak to the late Dr. Stephen Hawkins' theory of imaginary time? Yes, and, sir. And, and how that might affect the Kalam cos cosmological argument. All right. The Kalam cosmological argument, remember, was uh, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Hawking's uh, model that he developed with James Hartle um, is a quantum cosmology. It incorporates not only general relativity, but quantum mechanics, and it involves a finite past, and therefore a beginning to the universe. Hawking's model is therefore supportive of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. It's different from the standard model in that the beginning point of the universe is not a singular point. It doesn't involve quantities that are infinite, uh, such as space-time curvature and density and so forth. But nevertheless, it does have the feature of a finite past in the beginning of the universe. So in his 1996 book, uh, The Nature of Space and Time, Hawking said the following, today almost everyone believes that the universe and the time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. <coughs> I do. 
I didn't share the Leibnizian argument tonight, but I have defended it in print, and a simple formulation would go like this. Um, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. Premise two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is a transcendent external cause. Third premise, the universe exists. From that, it follows logically that therefore the explanation of the universe is a transcendent external cause. And that argument holds whether the universe is past eternal or not, and is therefore a distinct and independent argument from the cosmological argument. Okay. Uh, or Jeff, how do you explain the apparent fine-tuning of the universe that allows complex life? And then, with the question marks, there's chance, necessity, <laughs> Okay. 
actually. Let, let me try that for you. So in this, this person has obviously been reading my published work. That's his question. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, it's his question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> in which I give arguments for thinking that the cause of the origin of the universe is a personal idea. <laughs> and this illustration was simply meant to show how you can get a temporal effect with a beginning from an eternal cause that is permanent, namely through free will, through a free choice of this agent. The fact that the eternality of the agent involves regressive moments is immaterial to the illustration. Whether the agent is eternal in the sense of timelessness or in the sense of uh, infinite regressive moments is not germane to the point in the illustration, which is that free will can explain how you get a temporal effect at the beginning from uh, a permanently existing timeless cause. Uh, for Jeff, couldn't atheism be an adaptive evolutionary belief? Question. Could atheism be an adaptive evolutionary belief? Um, the the evidence suggests that the mechanisms in our minds that evolved naturally lead us to see agency, to see purpose, <laughs> to see all that stuff where it doesn't exist. And that as a matter, as, as a statement of fact, when you put all of those adaptive things together, what people do is invent imaginary so on and so forth. And so the way that it worked out, what evolutionary adaptive mechanisms led to was people being theist. Um, again, I would say, as I did earlier when we were talking about population genetics, that you need some people out there who can look at the world the way it is instead of just accepting their tribal belief. I'd say, you know, to that extent, having some atheists around is probably adaptive. In terms of the premise, what mandates that the supreme, I guess your premise, what mandates this, that the supreme being must be entirely good? Well, that would be the moral argument. The cosmological and fine-tuning arguments say nothing about the moral character of the creator and designer. He could be an absolute stinker for all we know. But the third argument, the moral argument, is what gives you the perfect goodness of God. I think that it's very plausible that Nietzsche, Russell, and Sartre were correct, that if there is no God, then moral values and duties are simply <coughs> human illusions bobbed off on us by evolution and social conditioning. Um, so that the unatheistic view, I just can't see any ground for objective moral values and duties. But, as I pointed out from Michael Bruce, it seems to me perfectly rational say that raping little children is objectively wrong, uh, and that therefore moral values and duties do exist objectively, and that logically implies that therefore God exists. Uh, since you might want to respond to that, I'm going to ask a question. This, this is a question of the technical Sorry. Can morality and ethics be considered rational about the existence of a God or higher Second, an awful 
lot of Christian morality, theist morality, leads to really awful things. For example, we know as a statement of biological truth that sexual orientation is a biological thing. And yet people say, well, I read the Bible because my morality tells me that that's got to be wrong. Okay. We could go down that long list. My sense is that the only way you arrive at objective moral values is by stepping outside of theism, asking real questions about the, the nature of who we are, um, me acknowledging that you are all real means that I have to acknowledge that all of your experiences are as real as my own, which means that it is irrational of me to expect you to value my experiences if I do not respect yours, okay? Um, I think there are many approaches to atheistic uh, morality, for example, the, the idea, which is a follow-on to this, that you can base morality on the thought of, okay, if I were going to be a member of a society that I did not know before I got there who I was going to be, how would I want that society to behave? This now truly is an objective morality, and not based on somebody's reading of a book that lets them go out and say, well, gee, I hate gays, you know, with Berman, which people have said. Uh. Yes, I would like to respond. Jeff says that morality is based on the nature of who we are. Now, who are you on the naturalistic, atheistic worldview? We're just simply relatively evolved primates with somewhat more complex uh, neural system. Uh, as Dawkins has said, we're animated chunks of matter. Uh, and on a naturalistic view, there's simply no reason to invest human beings with intrinsic moral value, much less to think that they have obligations to treat each other in certain ways. Jeff says, I, if, if you don't value my experiences, or if I don't value your experiences and you won't value mine, that's just simply self-interest. That's simply saying, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Um, and while that may explain the development, say, of altruistic behavior among the group of baboons, it does nothing to show an objective ground for it. This is, again, the genetic fallacy. Again. He thinks that because if things are evolved, because they have um, an evolutionary advantage, that then that somehow shows that they're not objectively real. So if empathy is selectively advantageous in the struggle for survival, that doesn't mean that empathy is therefore not a genuine good. But on atheism, there's simply no basis in the nature of who we are to found such objective values and obligations. So, so this, we're going into the next question. So, so Jeff, this is one for you. Just curious, considering the important roles of tribalism, as well as our constructive reality and the way they impact our ideas and beliefs, what are your thoughts on free will? Okay. Um, to I, what extent do we have a self that genuinely can make free choices? Oh, that's a fun question. Um, a question I'm going to ask you in a minute, though, is where your sense of morality comes from. I hope that we get to really have that conversation because it turns into a fascinating conversation. Is there, is there such a thing as free will? I think that depends a tremendous amount on how you define free will. Um, I'm going to answer that question at a pragmatic level. Has anybody ever heard of the game Step to the Line? Or it's not a game. It's, it's something that they, the, a, a program that they will do in prisons where you, you bring in a bunch of people from outside, you bring in a bunch of prisoners, they stand there, and then they start saying, okay, if your parents were married, step forward. If none of your relatives died a violent death, step forward. And they just keep doing that until after a while you realize that, that all the convicts are over here and all of the folks who came in from outside are over here. And then you have to ask the question, okay, to what extent are people where they are because of free will, and to what extent are they where they are because of the circumstances of your birth? This is one of those things where if you're a nice, well, 
we are who we are, and we, we you know, we, we gain simply by the, the, the fruit of our labors and our ethical. My father actually believed in the gospel, the wealth gospel. He thought that tithing was the way he was going to get money out of God, and there are plenty of people out there who believe in such things. No wonder you're in rebellion against Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> that to rape little children is morally wrong, and I see no defeater of that. I don't see any reason to think that that moral experience is delusory. Um, and so I'm perfectly rational to believe that doing that to a child is objectively wrong. So Okay, so let's okay. now, here's a, a couple of questions Tonight. before our summing up time mm -hmm. is coming oh. uh, in a few minutes. So, but here's a couple of questions uh, Mark, for both of you. Here's one. If I have a friend who is struggling to commit suicide, how can I rationally convince him or her to stop? You're p posing that to me? Or to both, both of us? One at a time. Um, oh boy, there are lots of ways to come at that. Um, There, how can you rationally? You can 
Turns out if you can just distract that person into other conversations for a time, then you can turn down the immediate desire. What you have to do to rationally help someone who is in that position is help them find a way to change their mental concepts about themselves so that they emote differently. There is a, a wonderful book by Lisa Feldman Barrett called How Emotions Are Made that applies the idea of the predictive brain specifically to emotions and makes the point that we have an extraordinary amount of power over how we emote about things because we have the ability to go in and make choices about the way we think about things. And so that's the way you approach those. Um, and it is very effective. That would be a sort of practical answer to the problem to counsel the person. I think what you'd want to do as well would be to give that person a basis for hope. And you could explain to that person that there is a God who created him, who loves him, uh, who wants to have a relationship with him, and that this can provide an objective ground for meaning, moral value, and purpose in living. And uh, that can provide then an unshakable foundation for uh, living a meaningful, purposeful, and valuable life. And to the extent that that works, it works for the very many of us. Uh, another one for both. What is your primary motivation for disproving your opponent's argument? <laughs> oh. I'll take that one. You want me to? Both. Both? both. Uh, well, okay, Bill, go for it. Okay, I'll let you go for it. Well, both. I guess I think okay. that atheism leads ultimately to despair. And this is not just my view as a Christian. This is what people like Bertrand Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Friedrich Nietzsche said about the human predicament. I think that atheists, existentialists, have given the best analysis of the human predicament that is available. And so um, I want to provide people with a basis for hope, for meaning, for value, for purpose. Um, and I think that uh, atheism cannot do that. But moreover, I think that atheism is just false. Uh, it seems to me there's no good reason to be an atheist. And I think there are good reasons to think that God exists. OK. OK. Um, you know, there are people out there who believe as powerfully in their perception of morality as Bill does who think the moral thing to do is to kill their daughter because she was raped. Okay. So this notion that this perceived sense of glorious divine morality is all about not raping children is not where we're going with this. When I look at theism, I see theism as a source of extraordinary tribalism, which stands in the way of the success of, of human I see theism as something that stands in the way of responsibility. For example, there are a great many people under the guidance of their theistic leaders who insist that global warming is some kind of a hoax. You know, Jim Inhofe gets up there and holds up a snowball and says, there's no global warming, and I know this because the Bible tells me so. Those kinds of beliefs pose a danger. Theism, because it so reinforces tribalism means that the leader of the, the, the theist leader is able to say, and oh, by the way, this also means that you're supposed to be support all free market economies. Boy, you talk about something that's evolutionary. So, so let's just, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay. And I'm sorry for keeping you okay. all standing oh. up here. So let's, we have a couple of questions, if okay. you don't mind, let's take a Absolutely. couple more minutes. So go ahead, why don't you ask your question? And say who it is for, but you for both. Um, thank you both for coming to ask tonight, thank you Bill. Um, so this is for <laughs> Professor Hester. Yeah. Um, when answering this question, I'd like, I'd like to ask you to conceive of God not as some narcissistic humanoid type figure that we've conceived of, but more of what Professor Craig has like alluded to in terms of a 
transcendent force that humans have not completely understood. But you know, a thousand, two thousand years ago, it may have been inconceivable for humans to think of measuring temperature to control and understand it. The same with electricity. Understanding, measuring galaxies billions of years away from us. And the reason that our scientific reasoning has come to this point because of the new understanding and new technologies. Now, seeing as humans have probably not reached the zenith of their understanding in terms of science, mm -hmm. do you think it possible that there could be new measurements in the future that could support the re uh, could support the belief and the existence of God? Okay. Not necessarily that this is true, but that yeah. the absence of yeah. evidence is not the evidence of evidence. Again, as, as a scientist, no such thing as certainty. I mean, I, I cannot be certain that, that the universe was not formed by a great deceiver, and really we all popped into existence three seconds ago, complete with our memories, and the first of the sentence never started, and so on and so forth. The scientist, I have to acknowledge even uncertainty about that. However, what you're talking about, and this applies to, to essentially all of Bill's argument, or the, the cosmology arguments and such as that, is that are there things that we do not know? Yeah, there are. Might those be places where God hides? Yeah, maybe. It's called a God of the gaps argument. But if you look over the extent of history, God of the gaps arguments have always failed. And the one last big place where people look to say, okay, that's the gap that God's going to hide in is the nature of conscious experience. And the nature of conscious experience is rapidly giving way. And so am I certain of it? No, I can't be certain about anything. Would I bet you a really, really good bottle of scotch? Yeah, I'd do that. Thank you. Do you want to flip no, back over? No, go to the next one. Okay, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask you to ask the question very quickly and then ask each of you because so we can get through some of the time. Sure. Go ahead. For, for, for uh, Professor Hester. So regarding your argument tonight, you say that the theistic belief we're discussing is based on tribal beliefs uh, passed down for generations. Mm -hmm. um, you also discussed that through the process of evolution, each generation then evolves into something better than the last. So technically, our modern generation would be the best, right? Mm -hmm. yes. so well, with, these, okay. with these points, why does our modern generation, which uh, going along with your argument would be the greatest scientifically, still dominate the world with theistic beliefs? And just to give you a statistic, 75.8% of um, people in the world are theistic believers, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, um, according okay. to Pew okay. reports. Okay. Good. Let's go ahead. You know, I, lots of answers to that. I'll, I'll mention one. Um, it has been within the last 30 years that you could actually make as compelling an argument as I am making you know, we think, oh, this is it for a long time. The scientific revolution itself was only a few hundred years ago. Um, and tribalism <laughs> hangs on. And so the idea that now we know, snap your fingers and theism goes away in the way that it works. There okay, can we, uh, yeah. can we go to the next question, yeah. please? Just because we want to get a few more. This is Dr. Hester. Your point about each of us experiencing the world in our own individual constructivist way rather than making epistemological conduct, I'm sorry, contact with any mind-independent ultimate reality. Reminds me of the blindfolded man in the elephant argument. How is it that you can step outside of your own constructivist paradigm to offer the objective conclusion that the rest of us are trapped in our own constructivist limited perceptions? I understand the question. And again, I perfectly reasonable question. Part of my paradigm part of, of the, the unshakable world that I hold in here is a dedication to the idea that what is true is more important than what I would like to be true. Applying that standard of regardless of what I would like to be true, it's what happens when you test the idea that matters. So that an idea that I really want to be true, if it can't stand up to that kind of scrutiny, it goes away is at least in part an answer to that. I'm human, scientists are human, man, they go at it, all of that kind of stuff. But ultimately, the commitment to the idea that I know means that I have tried as hard as I can to show that it's incorrect and so far has failed 
is the best way around that problem that we've got. Okay, I think, I'm sorry, I'm, this is gonna have to be the last question. I apologize. The, our speakers might be here if you could, well, we, may, we can chat afterwards perhaps, but we'll have one more question and then each speaker will give their five minutes conclusion. Okay, go ahead. So Professor Hester, this question is for you. Um, so there's an interesting phenomenon that you see in medicine, primary medical research. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes researchers want to show something. They want yep. to show that medicine works. They want to show that a procedure works and is beneficial. A lot of times what they're trying to find is tainted. And if that's tainted by mm -hmm. money, personal desire, mm -hmm. personal success. Um, so when you talk about science, um, in your personal experience, have you seen that in the study of evolution, of astrophysics, is science tainted? Because I personally see that in medicine a lot. I have to be very careful, at least in my profession, of what science I use. Oh man, scientists are people just like everybody else. We are not perfect. All of that stuff happens, you're right. But it turns out in science that all the big prizes come from goring the sacred cow, if you will. That that stuff goes on, but ultimately the data will out. And so, yeah, scientists do those things. But when we start talking about things like evolution, when we start talking about things like cosmology, I, had you attended the, the lunch talk, we, we kind of got into this a little bit, how deep the knowledge is and how it's tested. Um, then the very fact of our technological society, the very fact that when you study medicine, you study the things that you know about the body, tells you that that process is a process that does indeed lead to reliable knowledge, even in spite of the humanness of the people who do the work. So let's, uh, we're going to have to stop now with the questions. Uh, since you've gotten several questions, you haven't spoken for a while. Would you like to choose? Do you want to go first or second? To do a five minute summary? Yes. Um, I think I'm, I'm ready to go first. Okay. Um, in tonight's dialogue, I've offered two reasons to think that belief in God is reasonable for scientifically informed people. The first reason was that there are indisputable examples of scientifically informed people who rationally believe in God. And what Dr. Hester, Hester has to say is that people like Christopher Isham and George Ellis and Donald Page are irrational, that they are victims of tribalism and other sorts of influences that unlike himself, they have not been able to free themselves of these influences and so belong to uh, this elite group who manages to throw off these influences. And I find that enormously arrogant and condescending uh, to say of such great scientists as these. The fact is there's no tribe that is so influential as the tribe of the secular university, uh, and which mandates that you conform to that sort of tribal value. I, I see no reason whatsoever to think that Jeff Hester alone uh, or people of Israel are rational and these theistic scientists are not. But secondly then, I gave arguments as to why it's rational to believe in God. I gave the Kalam argument, the fine tuning argument, uh, the moral argument, the ontological argument, and none of these has been refuted tonight. Uh, what Dr. Hester has said is that this is God of the gaps reasoning, but that is clearly mistaken. My arguments are deductive arguments. They are not uh, using God to plug up the gaps in scientific knowledge. For example, consider the Kalam cosmological argument. In this argument, the second premise is the universe began to exist. That is a religiously neutral statement which can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. It is certainly a statement to which scientific evidence is relevant. In the fine tuning argument, the second premise was that the fine tuning is not due to physical necessity or, or design. 
That's a religiously neutral statement and critiques of physical necessity and of uh, chance have been offered by um, secular scientists. So this is not in any way God of the gaps reasoning. Rather, this is the way I would frame it. Science can provide evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument for a conclusion having theological significance. It's not God of the gaps. Science can provide evidence for a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. And I've not heard any good reputation tonight of the arguments that I gave. Instead, what we heard was a tissue of logical fallacies of trying to invalidate an idea by explaining how mankind came to hold that idea. And that just is the genetic fallacy. And I've given independent reasons for thinking that it's reasonable to believe that God exists, regardless of how one might have come to hold those beliefs. And, and therefore, I think it's, it's, as I say, just obvious that it is rational for a scientifically informed person in this age of science to believe in God. Thank you. Thank you. respond to a few things first. And again, I, I wish that we had had time to engage some of these questions more directly. Um, it's amazing how when your arguments get weak, you go to ad hominem attacks. First of all, the influence of secularism. We have a federal task force on religious liberty that is there to fight, lip quote, the dangers of secularism. You think it's easy to be a secularist? Think again. Responses, Kalong fine-tuning. I responded to his, his fine-tuning argument. Um, turns out that his very sources take down his Kalong argument. People are interested on my webpage, jeffhester.com slash unreasonable dash faith. You'll find a piece <laughs> where in their own words, his sources obliterate his argument. Uh, besides the Kalam argument, if ever there were a God of the gaps argument, well, we don't understand the beginning of the universe, therefore God. That's a God of the gaps argument. Philosophy, the difference between philosophy and not. Doing philosophy that doesn't respect the boundaries of what we know to be true about the world, that's not reason, that's not philosophy, that's I won't use the term that comes to mind. The ontological argument, if I were to give a technical response to that, I'd say that, uh, that his first statement about if there can be this ultimate thing is simply untrue. One of the things that people do in quantum mechanics have to face is that, you know, even if you were God, you still wouldn't know whether that electron was going to be spin up or spin down. So I could even make a technical argument that that doesn't exist. But let's set all of that aside. There are two possibilities. One, God exists. The other, God doesn't exist. It has an answer. That answer is independent of what any of us believe. If you're going to arrive at that answer, you have to say, I am going to look at the world apart from my beliefs. Now. I take the position that if you look at the world, if you look at how it is that the physical world behaves, if you take the knowledge that we arrive at by applying that testable standard of knowledge, you arrive at our world. On the other hand, when you talk about the theist world, well, somehow, there are these magical perceptions that even though we know our perceptions are constructed in these various ways, these magical perceptions I'm supposed to believe are something different. And yeah, okay, theists do really think that it's a good thing to kill your daughter if she was raped, but still, theism is how you get really good morals. And yeah, okay, once upon a time we needed God to explain why the sun moved through the sky, 
But you know, we haven't quite figured out that Big Bang thing yet. So that's, that's why we need God. One or the other of those two things is truth. I'm a scientist. I'm never going to say certain. But applying that standard of holding to the idea that can withstand the scrutiny, atheism wins that one, hands down. 